What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Father Daughter Dance Podcast, which helps dads keep up with the velocity of how things are changing for our daughters and um, gives daughters the space and kids the space to talk about the relationship too. Hey, please subscribe to and rate and review the pod. It really helps. You can find it pretty much anywhere. Um, and I'm delighted to let you know that my pod is currently in the top 5% of worldwide podcasts from a Nielsen type rating organizations. And, you know, the best part is that people who listen to it, listen all the way through. It's awesome. So thank you, dear listener, for all you do. And before we get into Maddie and Kate Arch join the pod as a beautiful follow-up to my podcast interview with their dad, Jeff Arch. Our discussion is a fascinating view and what it means to be a young woman and daughters in today's society. And, you know, they're both in the field of helping other people and through the worlds of emotional and mental health efforts. And we talk about how to listen to feelings, which any dad who's listening, I hope you listen. It's just gold. They provide a candid, funny, illuminating look into the younger generation's perspective. And we also talked about how Maddie and Kate relate to one another as well as their brothers. And the five kids have a special relationship. And we discussed how when difficult times come in the future, they want to keep that closeness. And, you know, we talked about the possibility of them getting help as a group before those hard times come around. I, I kind of want to touch about that in general and, and therapy as well. And I, I thank the God that I happen to believe in every single day that the younger generation has increasingly dis destigmatized help. Um, you know, it's so meaningful because obviously I have a daughter who's 23, but uh, for much of my life, I viewed therapy as a like triage, not as like a life strategy. I had no idea what I had to like look at in my life. And like, for me, like I came to my first therapy session with four suicides that included my immediate and extended family, a life destroying addiction that I recovered from growing up underneath a severely mentally ill and drug addicted brother who was a constant source of, um, of fear for me. And my family was the family that uh, did a lot of work to look good on the outside and um, no matter what was going on, on the inside and, and, and a lot more and stuff is damaging. And I entered therapy sort of out of desperation, but I didn't know how desperate I was until I was there. And so it was more like trying to recover from the bad stuff and not really like in a good space trying to get better. And I, I've since re reframed therapy. I, I, I think that therapy can turn a good life into a great life. It doesn't mean that it's never going to be triage because not everybody thinks it's uh, valuable until they really need it. Um, but it just reminds me that the generation that, like, like my generation talks about help with our parents by saying their perspective on is that's the, the way they were brought up in terms of like, oh, they thought differently about therapy and they didn't get help. And, and it's just, personally for me, I think it just irresponsibly ab absolves that generation from the damage they caused. And I don't believe in blaming my parents for the troubles I have in my life. Like the troubles are my responsibility. And yet that generation has some accountability to me. And, you know, that being said, I wonder what the younger generation sometimes thinks about my generation. And they'll eventually be saying, well, that's the way they were brought up. And it, it's so hard to know um, what our generation is doing. I think about it a lot. And um, we'll just never know. But I do know that at least some things are pretty easy to identify. And one of them for me that I think about is, my goodness, the way people who are my age, I'm 55 uh, and older, Talk about difficult subjects in just such an unconscious and divisive way, discussing the issues of the day. It's just the, the in every sense, it's awful. And it, it, it does not lend itself towards teaching the younger generation how to have a measured, 
mutually interested conversation about stuff that, you know, is really just political most of the time. And, and there's other categories as well. Um, but it's just, then it applies everywhere else. It applies everywhere else. And I sincerely hope the gener younger generation at sometimes looks at the way we talk and I do everything I can to not talk that way. I'm not always good at it, but I, I really try and look at balanced perspectives, which makes some people upset in my life that I don't believe in their way. Anyway, I just hope the generation younger than us just looks at it and says, ah, you know, uh, no thanks. I want to talk about this like an adult. Adult. Interestingly, in, in Jeff's pod, we discussed how he shares what's really going on at times with his kids about relatives and challenges they're having, what have you. And I say, thank goodness, it's a way forward. That's one of those things where my generation is actually making progress as well. Here's the main point. In a meaningful relationship, I think getting help early can help. Then again, getting help, period, helps. And I was wonderfully reminded that um, our younger generation not only seeks it, but in Maddie and Kate's example, are devoting their professional pursuits to providing it. Same way with my daughter, who's going to be a teacher. Look, that's my kind of dance. My friends, won't you join me on the dance floor? Step into the father-daughter dance podcast. Let's do this. Welcome back to another episode of the Father Daughter Dance Podcast. And it's a beautiful but overcast day in San Francisco. And I'm not sure where it is, what it is like, from where our esteemed guests are calling in from. Are calling in from, I'm, I'm like running a radio show or something like that. No, <laughs> join us on the podcast. I am delighted to have Maddie and Katie Arch on the podcast. How are you two? We're good. Yeah, we're great. Yeah, it's it's also a little bit overcast here today. It was it's been rainy the past couple of days, but which is personally frustrating to me because if it's going to be anywhere near to cold, I'd rather be beautiful and snowy outside, but yes. it is gloomy instead. Yeah. So, well, I mean, on the other hand, you could start writing a new Russian novel, right? If it's going <laughs> to be that, you All might right, as well. I you make a good point. Check yeah. that off my to-do list. <laughs> That's all. Check that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have been thinking about something because you're the Arch Sisters. Like, that is a name for a band. There is no question. That is a name <laughs> for a band. The Arch Sisters. You're not wrong about that. And what? I, as it, well, like, our family, our parents, like, a, a big thing when we were growing up is they, like, really wanted us to be musical. Yes. And, sorry, I know we haven't even done the intro yet, but. Uh, uh, go. Piano and violin was something that we were all raised with. Yeah. Um, sometimes disgruntled to do so, other times more enthusiastic. Uh, but we could start a band and be like the Arch Five, not the Jackson Five. The or <laughs> something like that. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Could you see that, Maddie? Um, personally, I probably would not be the most inclined to join that band. <laughs> Fair. But... Okay. It's a funny thought. It's definitely, it's definitely been like discussed. I feel like within our family with, with our siblings. But the, the interesting it. thing, though, is that you are a very like Type A logistics oriented individual. So maybe you run the band. <laughs> you do the musical <laughs> instrument side of it. Okay. Just saying, this is a thought. Okay, no, I like it. We're shaping it as we go here. And just so I know, when you say it was discussed in the family. You're not saying D-I-S-G-U-S-T. You are saying D-I-S-C-U-S-S-E-D. Oh, yeah, yeah, the okay. latter. The latter. Wait, wait, wait can, can either of you still play instruments? Yeah. Yeah. We all still, I mean, I, we can all play piano and violin. Yeah. I don't really like the violin, so I still just play piano. Katie, I, well, first of all, two of the brothers are singers and like, Oh, really good. they like take lessons are fantastic. Like you hear them singing in the shower and it's like that. That's really beautiful. Like sometimes too loud yeah. and a little bit annoying when they're in yeah. a funky mood. But um, yeah, I mean, I started learning how to do the God, I'm going to butcher. It's the it's like the mouth harp. Didn't go very long, but it's a really I cool know thing. the twang, 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 that thing. Yes, yeah. yes that one. <laughs> Um, Jeff sh sh would be so proud. Speaking of which, Jeff is uh, was a guest recently on the pod as well, and uh, this is going to be the second of the two pods for you. No, I, you said Katie. I, I thought it was Kate. Is it Kate or Katie? Interchangeable. 
interchangeable, Kate or Katie. Okay, well, thank you for joining us on the pod. This has been wonderful. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bye. Bye, bye. Um, so why don't we start by uh, introducing yourselves in whatever order you'd like um, and tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Okay. So my, yeah, my name's Kate, Katie. Um, I'm the oldest of the five. Madeline's the third. Um, I am 23, a recent grad from Northeastern University, uh, graduated my BS in behavioral neuroscience, and I recently made the transition from the hard sciences, like research field, um, into the very well-paying community mental health side of the field. Um, so I work uh, in one of the other suburbs around here as a crisis worker for a 24 seven um, crisis hotline. Like if wow. like people know of like 988, um, you know, if you are suicidal, if you're having a panic attack, if you're just having a really shitty day or your friend is and you don't know what to do, we get all those types of calls. And sometimes we do house visits and a pretty, it's a pretty cool, um, concept. So yeah, awesome. Oh, and by the way, swearing is welcome on this okay. podcast. Well, yeah. so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I always say you find the line by crossing it. You don't find the line by trying to stay behind it. So Absolutely. You, you did well. uh, no, just... Maddie. So like Katie said, I'm the middle child of five mm -hmm. and I'm 20 years old. I'm currently a junior at St. Louis University in Missouri and I'm studying- Slow. Yeah, slow. Roll bills. Right. Um, <laughs> I am currently studying speech, language, and hearing sciences. So I, it's basically like speech pathology, speech therapy. So um, yeah, I graduate next year. I'm planning on going to grad school somewhere. And then after that, we'll see what happens. But Grad school uh, for what? For speech pathology. So like I, I'll get my bachelor's in speech language and hearing sciences, but I can't like practice speech pathology. I like, I won't be a speech okay. pathologist until I go to grad. Okay. Um, did you ever see the movie Arrival? Is that, is that the alien one? Yeah. With Amy Adams. Yes. Yes. I did okay. see that, that a long time it. ago. Yeah. It was just about speech and communication yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And it was so moving. I'm, I don't, I'm going to spoil it for everybody, but it's relevant to what we're talking about. That's why I'm going to go into it because I was like crying, like just crying at the end because basically the, the, the culmination of the movie is she knows she knew what was going to happen and what was going to happen was a, an, an adverse uh, concept or adverse ending. And she still opted in for life. And um, it is. Uh, and so by the way, at the end, I was like standing outside the door as the person I was there with was going to the bathroom and people were coming out and we were all sort of, sort of just starstruck. And it was just like, I wanted to go have coffee and talk it over because it was really meaningful. Yeah. But um, because oh. you, you don't, you don't know how it's going to turn out, but if you knew how it was going to turn out, would you still opt into it? So um, it's just interesting to me that you both are studying and or entering into careers where that have an element of, very complex, but grounded human behavioral being of service. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You with me on that? Absolutely. No. Okay. Yeah. So how, how has learning how to, how has learning to both the field and the way to be of service been different from learning how to play the piano or violin? Whoa. How about that? Just blew Whoa. your mind. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I well, I'll start with the similarities. I think um, it's 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 something you have to, I guess, practice. Like, okay, yeah, we were we were very diligent with our our practicing instruments, and I think mm -hmm. that I think it's it's something like you learn. It's not really something that is. I think some people are more inclined to like acts of service and stuff like that. But I think it is something that you learn and you have to be exposed to and have like experiences with. You don't just naturally like, I don't know. Do you think different? <laughs> you and I are like, yes, you're right. Like in the very human behavior oriented fields. But I think mine is a little bit more 
I was going to say the opposite because like the way we were, we were classically trained. So like, you know, you do your scales, like all that other stuff for both of the instruments and played classical music. And it was, you know, like you said, diligent and very regimented. And I feel in this field, like a lot of it is for me is a lot more intuitive. Like, yes, I will go to grad school to like yes. yeah, theory, but um, you sit down and you play the classical music piece and there's a way it's supposed to sound. And like, I get a call and it's always going to be different. You might think you know what's going to happen. Never happens that way. Um, but at the same time, yeah, mine's a little bit more like on the whims of stuff. Yeah, you're, yeah. But ours, ours are a little bit different. But still, yeah, both grounded, I feel like, in in service and stuff like that. And working with others, I think, is something that I, I think our all everyone in our family is very like like to be with others and and I don't know, I guess group work, but like just connecting with others and stuff like that. I feel like all of us have are inclined to a field like that. I think that's absolutely accurate. And like something that's very much been on my brain recently is um, only children, the way that they're raised. Um, you know, people always have the trope, oh, they're such an only child, like all that other stuff. But I never thought about it in the context of, um, and this podcast, listening to my dad on it kind of started prompting it. And then a couple other things happened in my life. Um, how do I say this? But like something goes wrong within the family we have our little like pack of siblings who yes. are team oriented. We can help each other, help other people is a result of that. And like can turn to each other um, and work well, therefore in group environments outside of the household, I would, I would argue, um, which is a really beautiful thing that mm -hmm. like, unfortunately only kids don't have, they kind of have to like fight the battles by themselves. And I know I'm kind of jumping into it a little bit more quickly, but like that has just been so prevalent on my mind recently. And like how lucky I am that like I have backup. Um, yeah. For whatever I go through or like we go through as a family, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Well, are there places that either of you feel alone? Emotionally? I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think sometimes like, yeah, whatever you, you, everyone has those days, but I think that it is such a strong support system and mm -hmm. we are all very close. Like that's, and I know you, I mean, you could have four siblings and not be close and you might not yes. have that support system, but. I'm aware of that. Yeah. You <laughs> like with five. My, with, yeah. Five, five brothers, one passed away, but yes, five brothers. And yes, I'm very aware of the idea that with four siblings, you, you may not end up with the, we put the why in dysfunctional. So um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The that's, why, the what, the who, the when, everything, the where, true. every bit of it. We put all of it into the dysfunction. Anyways, keep going, Maddie. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah I, but, and yeah, that's something I think about. Like whenever I think about, oh yeah, like we're so close. I, I do think about the fact that like that we're very lucky to be so close because I think that when you have those days, you, you have a strong support system to fall back on. And chances are someone has been through what you're going through. Like yeah. out of the four siblings I can turn to, like I, I was on a call with my younger brother today and he was having some like friend troubles. He's a freshman in college. And so mm -hmm. he was just like, you know, classic like freshman in college, friend group drama, all that stuff. I think he, and he, he finds the dramatic people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but put this out there. He, <laughs> he does. He does. Like he, whatever. But he was I'm calling done. me and he was like, oh, you know, telling me everything that's been happening. And I yeah. was like, I don't know. I, I have advice to offer. Like I, I've been there and Katie's been there in different situations. Jack's been there. Nate will be there. Like we all have different ex experiences, but have experienced most things that you might be struggling with. So I think that's very, I guess, helpful. But also to your point about like the fa your family having like more of a dysfunctional, more or less of a dysfunctional aspect to it. Uh, I also think that like, Okay, how about this? Um, did would you, did you know from an early age on, like an early like age as like a, a family unit that you guys would not be close later in life? I didn't real well. Here's the easier way for me to answer that. I didn't realize how dysfunctional we were until I was about forty. Oh, oh okay, yeah, wow. I, I mean, my fa my family like I, I remember I was I was meeting with someone who was coaching me and my girlfriend at the time as a couple and. I basically was talking to them as if I had an idyllic 
upbringing and I started talking about it and, and it was just like, oh yeah, my one brother committed suicide and we had mental health issues. And it's like, that's not, and, and it's like the, the brother who killed himself was right above me and he was traumatized me as a kid. But it's just like, because this is what, I, I know you want to keep going, but I, I also want to add to this to the conversation so we can grow from there is because my family was very much about you always look good on the outside, no matter what's going on the inside. And I took that and stenciled it onto myself personally, mm -hmm. which was really damaging. Um, and I worked on that a lot. And so, because the, the, and I want you to continue on the thread you were on Katie, um, uh, because I'm curious about your perspective of what your family's like on the inside and what you think it looks like on the outside, but keep going. Okay, that that is so loaded. There are so many things I want to respond to. That. <laughs> it's really beautiful, different like tangents we could go on. Um, first of all, though, that concept of nice on the outside, a little rocky on the inside. My dad mentioned this on the podcast. That does apply to our family, probably not to the degree that it does in yours, but um, just because addiction runs in our family, like, and my dad was talking about how, like someone who's an addict or like is addicted to something just inherently is a liar for a period of time of their life. Right. And so because of that, I think that concept of it looks okay on the outside, not good on the inside and all like hush hush does apply to our family. But I think we're starting to like my dad mentioned like his honesty towards like with us. He is making a huge push to move away from that. And that's having an impact on all of us, I think. So, like, as we get older, move towards honesty. Not more, wait, sorry, not away towards honesty. Thank you. And um, would you say move away on it from honesty? No, towards. no, towards towards. Okay, got it. Push okay, towards. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I my yeah. words. Um, and you talk about like the our generations and younger generations having like a better chance with all this stuff. Hundred percent. I think my dad's one of those people that really is helping push that narrative. And of course, it's awesome. Um, and then to answer what I was initially going to say, sorry, I'm monologuing. That's okay. It hits me over the head every once in a while where it's like, yeah, we are super tight right now to whatever degree we have like good days and bad days, but we're also, also young still. And like, we have yet to really experience like real life hardships. And so who's to say 10, 20, 30 years down the road, we will also be talking to each other and God willing, but yeah, we just don't. Life's hard and people are difficult and complex. So, Maddie, what, what I want you to know, uh, would you describe yourself as uh, someone who gets their energy from the inside as opposed to extroversion? I mean, why don't you get to know? <laughs> because here's, here's, what I'm, here's, what I'm, here's why I'm asking that question. What I want you to know is on a podcast, because I've, I've been watching the um, – camera, but I also check in on you every once in a while and I'm listening to Katie and I can tell there's a lot going on. And sometimes you just need a little space to process it. And so what I'm saying to you is quiet space on the pod is okay as you're trying to gather your thoughts. You understand oh, what yeah. I'm saying? I'm, like, I'm a big, I, I, I'm just trying to not zone out. <laughs> like I'm oh. trying Oh, not, not because of you. No, I know there's a copy right there. So you're, there's, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying, I have to like stare at the wall to like, in order to like, listen and fully understand. I understand. Um, take your time. Just take your time. But it's thank okay. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it takes me a while to process. Things. I know. That's also, what I'm saying. Speak, it's okay like, to take your time. Like, yeah. Yeah, thank Kate, you. Kate, Kate, yeah. Kate, like me is, is, is like drinking from a fire hydrant now and again. She just goes for it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Anyways, <laughs> I love that. That was verbal stalling for you, Kate. I mean, sorry, Maddie, to give you some time to, um, and just take a, take a deep Thank breath you. if you want to go ahead. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you said. I do think about that. Sometimes I think like we've been very fortunate to have not a lot of hardships. Like we've definitely, I don't know, experienced some things, but like not in the grand scheme of, I don't know, all the shit that goes on in the world. But like, I think. I, I agree. I do think that, like, who knows in t in ten years, fifteen years after something happens, like, how is that thing gonna change our relationship? And like, 
is it going to change our relationship or is it going to change all of our relationships, our relationships with our parents? Like who, who knows? But I, I, whenever I do think about that, I just still am like, okay, well right now it's fine. So like, that's all I, that's all I, I have no idea what's gonna happen in the future. So I'm just like, oh, thanks. Thankful that we have a relationship now and I can use that relationship and further it and work on it yeah. and do whatever it needs. But that's all I can really do right now. Yeah. And the thing is, is that it goes back to now I know why I mentioned arrival. You're right. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And even if you did know that in 10 or 15 years, something's going to happen for sure. Is um, even if you had insight to what it was, you would still opt into the process, no matter how painful it is, because that's the. Right. Um, um, so, Maddie, given that you study speech pathology. Um, you know, you mentioned you talked to your brother. Um, can you help me understand how that relates to how you talk about or listen to someone talk to you about their feelings? Because what was interesting to me is when you mentioned your brother spoke to you about difficult stuff that's going on, it was, and this is something, I think I mentioned it on the podcast with Jeff, is that my women friends who I adore, I adore, they, they like to talk to me because they, because I can listen to somebody talk about their feelings. And it's just like, oh my God, wow. And they always say, I want more men that can listen to me and, and not talk, you know, talk about my feelings. And then I'll start talking to them about my feelings and they will immediately start like solving the problem immediately <laughs> rather than just be like, I'm just here. To, I just want you to hear me. That's all I want. Um, but the question I have with regards to speech pathology and talking about your feelings, it was interesting to me. You said he talked to you and you said, I, I had advice. And can you talk about how you talk about your feelings and how you listen to others talk about their feelings? Yeah, I, I think, well, in terms of what I'm learning right now yeah. um, and just with my major, I think that it's the differences between men and women and their communication and their, the language they use and how they interact with their communication partners is so interesting because they're so different. And I mean, I don't, I think it's pe something people notice, like you obviously notice it. I'm sure when, you know, when you talk to guys, like it's, it's very clear, like women are going to talk more and they're going to listen more and they're going to face their communication partners and they're going to ask questions and they're going to interrupt and interject because they want to like, in, it shows engagement when they interrupt and interject. But for a man, when they're, when you're talking, it's, I think it's more of a, a competition. It's, it's more who, who I'm, what I'm saying is the most important. So don't interrupt me because that's that you're interrupting me. And like, I'm what I'm talking about right now is important. It's not engagement. If you interrupt me, um, mm -hmm. and, and the stance that they, uh, we, we talk about this in my speech classes, but like, just like the stance that men go in, you know, they're, you know, standing side by side and they're just, you know, talking and they're not really facing, facing each other and, and just like, you know, <laughs> talking and touching and whatever. Um, so I think that just in terms of speech is super interesting and that's definitely influenced how I engage with people. I think like when I talk yeah. with people, I think I, I just know now, cause I've learned about this stuff. I'm like, oh, I know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, so I think that's interesting. It's actually very interesting to me that you talk about the divide between or the difference between men and women, because, um, the reason I do all this is because I don't think that divide needs to exist. I, oh, I yeah. Don't, I don't. Um, but uh, it, it was really just about like when you are listening to like your brother talk about, because when you say he's having freshman drama, what he's really doing is talking about his feelings, even though he's just talking about the situation. Oh, yeah. He's talking That's about his feelings. And so it was just, it was just interesting to me. He said, I had some advice and I was just wondering whether like what that feels like when you're having the conversation with him and, and would he, how does he react when you really start like just talking like that must be difficult. Tell me more kind of stuff. I think Brendan and I were very close and we have a very 
good relationship. And I think that especially now that he's in college, our phone calls, I mean, we we catch up on our phone calls, but oh, oh, many of our phone calls in, in the past couple of weeks have just been like, hey, oh my gosh, speak of the devil. He's calling me right now. <laughs> oh my God, that is so good. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll, I'll call him back after, but- Oh my God, he's calling me now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that would be weird. That would be weird. Wild. Um, many of the many of the phone calls he's we've you know had in the past couple of weeks have just been him trying to navigate situations about being, yeah. being in college, whether it's friends, whether it's you know, yeah, it's scary. Major, it's yeah, it's a lot. And so I think I am really thankful for our relationship because I think he comes to me not just for advice, but also like he knows. I can listen to him and I'll, I'll just sit on the phone for 20 minutes while he rants. Beautiful. And, and then while at the end, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I he'll, just, he'll vent and say, you know, this is what happened. So-and-so yeah. did this. I'll sit on the phone for 20 minutes. And, that, and then at the end of the call, I'll say, okay, here are my thoughts. And, and I'll say, okay, I think, you know, you're overreacting about this, or I think you're, you could do this instead, or this is how you could say it to this person. And I mean, sometimes he doesn't always take my advice, but he, I think it's just helpful to, I, I like the format of our phone, phone calls because I just let him, s- s- you know, explain his feelings and express yes. emotions and stuff like that. And then uh, at the very end, I'll say, okay, you know, here. And I, and I, and I refrain from interrupting, I think most of the time, because I'm like, okay, I think he just needs to, Good for you. you know, word vomit or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think speech though has what? So I just you just I get a notebook and like write down bullet points because yeah, I'm like I'm he'll, I'm he'll monologue not like monologue but like it's sometimes a lot because there's so many people involved in his stories. Yeah, and yeah. so taking notes honestly, so you don't you don't, you don't forget certain points. Yeah, because you're being respectful and not interjecting. I'm just thinking like the that would just be the best. No, that that's it, that's what I'm saying. I have to stare at a wall because when he's talking, <laughs> I stare at a wall and I just funny. have to listen so I don't like zone out because he's just like sometimes goes in circles, but. Yeah, I, I it is interesting to connect my what I've learned. I mean, I we haven't in my speech. I'm only you know two semesters into this major. Um, cause I because I switched majors, so I'm not like that far into it. But um, it is interesting to like see the differences and when I'm communicating with someone, like how do I change my communication? Do you change your communication? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she needs to stare at the wall to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, I mean, everyone, everyone changes their communication with everyone. Totally valid. Like, you just don't notice it, or, or maybe you do notice it because you're aware of it. But everyone does it, regardless of if they know or not. By by the way, can, there's one thing I do want to say. You don't need to minimize yourself here. <laughs> don't, you, don't, you don't need. I'm serious. You don't need to say I've only done two semesters of it. It's like no, I'm two semesters in. Period. <laughs> Like, there's no, like, like yeah. it's just, it's, it's just interesting to me just to hear someone like you talk in a way that is illuminating. And I haven't thought of it that way. And that, but I'm not in the meantime thinking, oh, she thinks she's an expert. That's just not what I'm thinking. I'm yeah. thinking she's oh, educating her. me. And so just, I want you to know that, but um, that's very helpful. It, it, it's, <laughs> you just brought something up to me that I'm going to write about at some point, which is. Mm-hmm. Um, with guys, um, sometimes I hear my guy friends, um, say, I just want to vent. And all they're really saying to me is I want to talk about my feelings. They don't know they're saying that, but that's actually what's going on. Um, verbal vomit is another way to say it, but, and, and I, and I want to, I want to ask Kate a question, um, which is because Maddie brought up the idea that Guys have a way of communicating, which I know you're not saying every guy's that way. That's not what I'm saying. But it's it's just, it is illuminating for me to think about the fact that your generation is still being taught a normative way of looking at different types of communication, which may be valid and is yeah. not ideal. Uh, it's, it, it, it just, it calls on me to do more work with my daughter because she's a teacher um, and she works with young people. But um so, Kate, you're welcome to comment on anything that we've talked about to this point. And I would like to hear your perspective on 
how your father, why do I use the word father? Boy, I feel like it needed to be <laughs> or something like that. Jeff, your dad. Um, patriarch. How has he, what's that? I said the patriarch. If the you patriarch. <laughs> Down That's with the patriarchy. Um, uh, how has your dad, have you helped your dad grow in the way he talks about his feelings? It's just like, what is he modeling for you in regards to that exact conversation we just had? I would say, and just to validate all the stuff that my dad talked about on the podcast, he is a really, really great listener. And it's really awesome to like have that because, and he like kind of mentioned this about our mother. She's just, she is not as much of a listener. She just moves too quickly in her life to just, she, she can be. She, she can be. Yes. But you have to like pin her down. And, and, and it has to be on her terms though, I think. Yeah. And it it, it is very, yeah. But it, it's, just, it's a lot harder to get this in, I think. It is. And that that's just the nature of her brain and how quickly she moves. Yeah. Um, And we're lucky to say that like we, our dad does very much so listen. And I think watching him process his emotions is something that I think I don't know if I necessarily had an impact on that, but I, uh, myself particularly, but I think my age has had a role in that. And just like, as we've all gotten older mm -hmm. and we start to see like family dynamics more clearly because we're all going through it together, he is just there for, and I think his like little epiphany of like, let's be honest about this stuff up front, no gaslighting, no lying, like, right. He is with that own personal revolution in conjunction with like us all maturing and getting older and realizing what's going on. He's like taking it on its own to like come to me and talk to me about this stuff and and his emotions. And honestly, I, I do feel very lucky a lot of the times because um, I look at a lot of my friends, fathers and a lot of the, the dads are that still stereotypical like reserved about their emotions, probably don't know how to tap into their emotions mm -hmm. at all whatsoever. And I'm not saying my dad is perfect by any means, but like he does, like I have seen him cry, like, and stuff like that, where it's never been like, a, I have to hide this from all the people in my life. Yes. Rawr, like he is okay with that sometimes. And that's to show that vulnerability as an older and older individual and a man, I think is really powerful. And it's great for my brothers to see as well. Yeah, that's, um, what, I, that's what I was going to say. I think it is important for our three brothers to see that too and see how he listens yeah. and how he like interacts with his kids, but also just how he handles his emotions and expresses his thoughts and feelings. Because he's, he's very calm. Like there's, he's just like so calm i don't know like he, he thinks a lot more with like there's like the the emotional mind and there's like the logical mind like people talk mm -hmm. about and like mm -hmm. he he thinks He's, a lot more with logic yes um and Which it's good go yeah i just think it's helpful to have a role model like that and our our again our mom is great but she she's she's a more emotional i think brain yeah what, what am i saying she uses the her emotional brain a little bit more versus the logical and I don't know it's not a bad thing but it's it's very clear I guess when it comes to in terms to and they balance each, uh, yeah. each other out very well because like because of the logic that he brings to the table and not just the logic but his patience with it mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that is crucial oh one more thing just about the whole the venting versus giving advice stuff um when I was a sophomore in college, I had a friend that would come to me and would vent. And through and through, I am a let's solve this problem right here, right now. Let's interject. And like, because I don't want to see people in pain. I don't want them to suffer needlessly. Like, let's fix it then, right? And I never thought that some people just wanted to vent because I want people to help me solve my problems. So, which is not how everyone else thinks, right? And she looked at me one day and she said, can you just like listen? And I was like, oh, this is an option. And so... <laughs> It, like, genuinely, like, never crossed my brain, which is fine. But now, like, what I try to do in most situations, unless someone already off the bat communicates it to me, after they finish talking or in the middle or beginning of it, it's like, what do you want from this? Would you like advice for me? Or do you want me just to listen? 
yeah. doing a combination. And then like it kind of gives them a second to think about what they want because they might not know initially mm-hmm. either. And it's like the concept of like, I bring this up a lot because um, I lead groups, but uh, sorry, this is such a little bit of a tangent, but a lot of people don't like physical affection and hugs from strangers, from family members, all this other stuff. And the concept that I learned um, from my family is not everyone likes hugs. And if I want to hug someone, I just, do you like hugs? Can I hug you? Like, just because it's in my brain one certain way doesn't mean it's in their brain a certain way. And so just opening up that playing field in all areas of my life has been like just asking the questions to have people communicate better to me. It's been amazing. What's so interesting to me about this is that uh, I was literally going to say what you just said, which is when I'm talking to somebody, what I say to them is, what do you want from me? Do you, I'm here to, if you want me to listen, I'm here for you. If you want my perspective, I'll, I'll share it with you. If you want advice, I'll share it with you. But you opt into what you want out of the conversation. And my experience invariably is there is a moment of shock of the person I'm speaking to. And then like total relief because mm. they feel, uh, sometimes I even do it at the beginning of the conversation um, just so they know as they're going through it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was interesting to me. I, I'm not a speech, speech pathologist. I don't even play one on TV or on this podcast, <laughs> but what I, I do pay attention to what people say because it was, what you said was uh, it didn't even cross my brain to have that possibility, which is exactly accurate because the brain doesn't think that way. The heart certainly does, but the brain typically goes to solution mode. I, I do have a very particular question for you, Kate, because uh, you shared with me before we start the podcast that uh, you, your pronouns are they, them, their. Mm-hmm. And um, do you identify as non-binary? So I know. That's a complicated question. <laughs> okay. All right. But- then, then don't, then, if you don't want to talk about it, let's not talk about it. Because um, what's so interesting to me, and I do it too, um, is I'll say men and women when it's just like, well, there's like this whole other complete group that um, may not fall into those categories. And it's just, um, it's just complicated. It's just complicated because um on the one hand, I do understand that that a good percentage is in those two categories. And on the other hand, like, as I mentioned, it's like those two categories, like they don't need to be different. And um, just the things that both of you are talking about is, so I have arguments with my friends um, who complain about the younger generation and, and I am 100% behind the younger generation. I think there are parts that ultimately are going to create some generational wounds. I think that inclusiveness inclusiveness is wonderful. Weaponized inclusiveness is going to cause problems. Absolutely. Um, and so that's what the, that's what my daughters and because my daughter's 23, what that next generation will deal with. But I would rather have them, the, the generation you're in, which is so destigmatized help. Thank God almighty, the destigmatized help. Um, as long as there's quality help, and that's, I think there's a, there's an imbalance of supply and demand there. But if you destigmatize help and the generational wound you're, you're, you, that you may be passing on is weaponized inclu- inclusivity, that group will, will, will get it because what comes out of that, this is, I'm, I'm literally just thinking about all this right now and you can talk about it if you want, because I do want to hear your concepts about like what your friends, what their experiences are, what their dads and the feelings, all kind of stuff, because weaponized inclusivity creates pressure and even on people like me as a comic or a writer or whatever it is because like I had recently said god bless the people who say the unsaid it needs to be said right but weaponized inclusivity means you are increasingly careful about what exactly you say with the possibility of what i just mentioned which was you got to cross the line to know where the line is yes and with you Kate having the they them there and we had the conversation before and it was Grayson Kaufman that's the person who I interviewed uh who was a kid of a dad that I interviewed who told me about the story and then Grayson was the next episode is that your your perspective of and I told you like I'm going to make mistakes in the references I I do it sometimes when you respond to it with understanding and and when corrected if I've worked on my own stuff, then I don't get combative with you. I've never really thought of all that before. I've never written it. I, it's actually pretty profound, at least for me, it's profound. But it does lead to a question. And you can comment on anything I've just said as well. 
because what I would like to know from you as two different parts of a younger generation, because there is a difference between 23 and 20. I know that for sure. Um, what your perspective is on, let's start with this, your friends and how they feel they can talk about their feelings with their dads. Let's start there. In my experience, my all of my friends have pretty similar like relationships with their dads. And I think that might just be chance and how I ended up friends with them, you know, just random, whatever. But I, most of my, the majority of my friends have similar relationships and, and they're, they're pretty close with their dads and they, you know, go to them for advice. And I don't know how great of listeners they are exactly in comparison to our dad, but I think personally that, I don't know. I don't really have, I don't know what you, if you have friends that have issues with their dads, but I think all of mine are pretty similar. I feel like, or to, mm. I, I do think that like, I think I got lucky because I think most of my parents and like, let's just throw this out there. Like my college friend group was mostly men except for one book. And then another chick kind of occasionally, but it was like a bunch of, it was three guys in me. And, um, and my knowledge, one of them was raised by a single mother. She chose to be, she chose to adopt these two kids. Mm -hmm. Such a bad, bad, bad bitch, whatever you could say. Baddie. Can I you say know. bad bitch? Bad bitch. Just, bad that, bitch. If, if you understand bad bitch, then bad bitch works. Yes. <laughs> she just like, oh, yeah, she's. She's a bad bitch. Like it was really, it's very empower, like, empowering, like what she did. And, um, but the rest of them, no, it's more of like that, like the, their dads, it's more surface level and you can just see it in just the way their interactions are more just like gentle banterish with their dad. And maybe I'm not seeing stuff behind closed doors. I also dated one of those, one of those guys. And like, I don't think that he ever really had very intense deep, emotionally involved conversations with his father. And I think, I'm sure if he needed to, his dad would be there for him. But um, yeah, I really, I think most people are still, we're still moving past that stuff. And like you talk about trying to like break down those barriers. Unfortunately, I, it'll take more generations after us, right? And um, yes, it will. Yeah, I think we're still pretty far from that. But, and your your concept of, um, weaponized inclusivity kind of goes into that as well, where it's like people, what my, from my understanding, and my dad is someone who's very involved in these political conversations as like a relatively more conservative, moderate conservative individual, and he's well-versed mm -hmm. in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like a pendulum. Like right exactly. now, we're going back into like weaponized inclusivity, which is not helpful when it's this far, but at some point, you know, we have enough leftist liberal kids here. We also have people who are still raised by conservative parents who are leaning towards more towards moderate because of their leftist friends. At some point, it will settle back down into the middle of just general inclusivity and like education about the people and the cultures, sexuality, gender, blah, 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 all around us. Yes. Not great that it's weaponized, but I think that will settle with time. Yeah. It's not always weaponized. Just see, I, I, I think yeah. it's, it's not always weaponized, but. Maddie, did you want to, I got the sense you might want to share a little bit more. No, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, when you were talking, I was just trying to think of like my friends and their relationship with my dads. And I think all of my close friends right now that I can think of, like, I've heard them talk about their dads. I've, you know, I've heard, overheard phone calls with their dads and they're all, I've met a lot of their dads and I, yeah, I think it's, it is different than your, I think your friend's experiences, but. They're all, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't notice anything. I thought they were, yeah, similar relationships to our. This is going to be a direct question, uh, but we can also make it a broader question, which is, do you find yourself choosing healthy relationships? Oh, like, so and I'm talking about, I'm talking about to the degree that you're on the same page with me. I'm talking about like intimate relationships. And if you're not comfortable talking about that, you can also talk about, um, what your perspective is on people, you know, you don't have to talk about your friends. I do not want you to mention anybody's name or anything like that, but it's just like, do you find people choosing healthy relationships? Do you want to start? 
No. That's <laughs> a great question. Okay. Um, you talked about earlier on how you did not realize your family dynamics were dysfunctional until the age of 40. Yes. I am coming to that realization. As much as my parents are beautiful in their relationship, yeah. they're humans. And so they have struggles. And then you add five kids on top of it. That makes things even more bonkers bananas. And so I thought it was healthy to base my relationships off of them. Mm -hmm. And I realized I can absolutely take aspects of that I think are healthy and beautiful for them. But there are certain ones that I do not need. And knowing those things that are, you know, non-negotiable uh -uh for me or relatively negotiable not not for me has been very helpful in uh Finding partner. I'm like five months in with this this chick, Evie, and oh, I said, "Well, that's her name. That's okay." Um, but she's also comes from an interesting family dynamic like that, and has like recognized that both of us have mm -hmm. like watched our family dynamics, decided what we want and we don't want, and then tried to find healthy partners as a result of that. And that is trial and error. And I'm still young, and we'll see. I'm hoping this one's not a trial and error, but you definitely can learn from your parents. In that yeah. sense with partners. Um, so I've never had a boyfriend, okay. but I agree with you. So I still do think like when I do get into a relationship, like I've learned a lot from not only our parents' relationships, but like your relationships, oh. our brothers' relationships. Like I I I mean, I was I was I'm still close with you and like I know Evie and I know You knew Mike. I knew Mike and I, I know all these people like that again because we're so close as siblings not just us but our all of our siblings like you I, i'm relatively close with all of the partners that i feel like or my siblings have had um and i have a couple friends that have serious relationships that are all mm -hmm. healthy oh um, nice but yeah. i do i mean there there are times like one of my friends is in a relationship of like three or four years and like 75% of that relationship has been long distance and wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And, 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 so, and, you know, they've gone through, they've had their ups and downs and stuff like that. But I think it's, I honestly think it's helpful for me to see because I, because I'm like, Oh, like this is, this is shit that people go through. And like, I obviously don't know, but like I've had enough experience with people around me. So like you said, mm -hmm. like, I know what I, what I like and what I don't like. And also for my friend, like when they're going through a tough spot, you know, she'll be like, oh, you know, my boyfriend is saying this or doing this. And I'm like, you know, I can't, I've never, I don't have firsthand experience, but I, I think I have enough knowledge of like what's right and what's wrong to, you know, still be support, supportive of her. But it's, yeah, we'll see. I don't really yeah, know. I mean, it's also true that through my daughter, my daughter and her, they, they do generally think about relationships differently than we did. Like, like the biggest example for me was, was proms where it was just like so many people went by themselves and that was just, was yeah. not the way it was. And just relationships are different. Um, I, I, uh, an intimate relationship are one thing, but I, I do see that, um, even if you quote unquote, haven't had a boyfriend yet or an intimate, um, committed relationship of some, some, um, length, you still can learn from the, your friends, as you mentioned. And, um, you know, the thing for me is, um, I'm in a long distance relationship. I'm, I'm dating a woman. And, um, the, 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 the main thing I'm, uh, aware of is that idea that I'll go with what's familiar, even if it's not good for me. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that for me has really been like, I married my, a, a woman who was like my mom. I had a last long-term relationship I had was like my mom. And I've healed a lot from my relationship with my mom. And uh, this woman I'm, I'm seeing now has some aspects. And it's, it is very challenging at times where she'll be talking to me. And it's as if a curtain closes and opens and it is now my mom talking to me. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge for me is she does something and it merits an emotional reaction of three, like out of 10. But my reaction is seven. And that additional reaction has to do with my unhealed wounds. And there is something I wanted to ask you guys, which is 
So you, you, the five of you, uh, the five of you are close and you mm -hmm. understand that, um, in the future, there'll be difficulties. And so a lot of increasingly people who are getting into new relationships, which includes me, we're talking about this is before it's a dumpster fire is to get therapy, right? Yes. <laughs> so have you, have you, have the five of you ever talked about like, Maybe we should do like once a quarter, like a group therapy session where we can keep adding to our tools to, to get some reps of working through things so that when the time comes that life will get lifey, as they say, have you ever considered that? We've talked about not just us five, but a, a full family. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe once or twice we've thrown it out there and it's never happened, but we haven't, I've never really even considered or thought about uh, a sibling therapy session. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I don't know. I, 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 I know that therapy is like a lot of preventative um, work and stuff like that, but I am still always like, Oh, well, we're fine right now. So like, why would we go to therapy? Like, I, I, I know that's a terrible mentality. No, no, no. It's, a, it's an honest mentality. It's, but, it's, a, it's vulnerable to admit that. So, yeah, so uh, I, you're courageous. Yeah. Say it. But I, I do, but I, but still like we have, I think we have pretty good communication right now. I think we are, we're all, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I've never really thought about it. What do you? Tim, I really just love the fact that you are aware of how important it is to do preventative Katie loves therapy. therapy. Katie I love <laughs> therapy. Seriously, like from like the age that you are, like your generation, generation below, above, like do not understand that for the most part. And, mm -hmm. and even my generation, like I'm talking to my girlfriend and yet five months only, but I've told her like, if this is a long-term thing, before problems arise, like long and serious problems, I want to make sure we have a healthy foundation. And that is that is why you go to couples therapy early on. Yes. And the same thing. I never thought about it with the five. And just the fact that you are yeah. aware of that is so awesome. Um, I I My initial reaction to that one, though, is fear. Just about the <laughs> only five of us for whatever reason. Because I think, unfortunately... Ah. Yeah, I, we probably should. It would be really awesome to it just be interesting. figure some of this stuff out. It would out be cool. Because I don't want to lose you guys. and oh. Or one of you. Or two. And like, it couldn't hurt to do preventative work on it. Also, all of you guys should be in individual therapy. And then we do the family therapy. I, I'm not sure about that every one of you should be in individual therapy. That's a little that's a little harsh. But uh, I, I, I love... <laughs> There's love behind it. How about that? Yeah, there's, there's a love lot of love good intent. Well, uh, what's, what's true is that therapy has been talked about in such a way for so long that it feels like, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is for it, but it's like when you go into a, a triage, it's, 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 it's been, it's, it's in this category that like the majority of the time it's thought about like triage. And um, that's one of the reasons I also love your generation is, 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 is that I think that when the def, when the, when the definition is broadened, mm -hmm. uh, it's no longer looked at as um, from bad to recovery, but from good to great. And, and the thing is with, with, uh, with my relationship, it's like, we've had, we've had some fights and arguments and, um, but we're not on the brink or anything like that, but it's like, we need to learn the communication skills because we're both over 50, but it's like, things are good right now with you guys. And also it's the best time to start learning how to talk about stuff when it's bad. I'm not trying to advocate for you guys to do that or anything like that, but it's just, it just dawned on me because my daughter's an only child. Actually, that's not true. She has a sister with her mom and her new uh, husband, but, uh, or not new husband, her, she's been, her, he's been her husband for a long time. Um, and I've always said to my daughter that 
it's just this interesting dynamic. Like I can't force her to go to therapy with me. I would go to therapy with her in a second. Like if she said, I want to do this together, I'd be like, I am all in. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't force her. I'm in therapy. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's, um, it's, it, it's so funny to hear you both talk about it because, uh, it was like, I'm not opposed to it. It couldn't hurt. It's like all these really gentle ways of saying, maybe we should try it, you know, <laughs> but, what's, but what's underneath it is this very uh, sweet, honestly, is the best way to say it of like love and devotion for each other. And so I get the idea that it's scary. Um, and, and it's, What's what continue like it's, it's like another point for me. I, I know I suffer. I don't know if I suffer from it, but I do confirmation bias. And when I believe a certain thing, I start to look for other things to prove it. And just that you would be potentially open to it. It's just a million times different from me when I was growing up a million times different. Um, uh, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Well, you know? I was going to say, well, first of all, and that's like the beauty, like you're saying, breaking down these stigmas and the fact that you could totally be your age and still oppose a therapy. So kudos to you and that means you are like such a better father partner friend right. I, I you know it gives you the, the ability to be that in your comment when i said like everyone should be in therapy and i say that regardless of trauma no trauma Me small too. or trauma simply because um everyone should have an unbiased person that they can talk to about their life um even if it's just running through the week and they're overwhelmed or if it was a good week and yes and uh, yeah, so I am a plug for therapy. I hear you. Um, and, and by the way, like even the word trauma, what's really helped me is to broaden that definition. Because I always thought trauma had to be like really like war or something like that. It's like, no, like if I was emotionally and physically like at risk at all times with my mentally ill drug addicted brother, that's freaking traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so and so. What happened with me is as you were talking, what I noticed is my body started to tense up. And um, what that usually is signaling to me is there's like some fear in me. And I think, and then when you said you were scared or fear, it's like, then it identified with my body. So I, I do, I, I have two more questions. Um, the music one will be the last one, but here's the, here's the one that just occurred to me. I've made it pretty clear about how I feel about your generation and other people feel differently about your generation, which is fine. Um, I want to know whether you have hope for our generation, meaning my generation or your, my, mine and your dad's generation. Do you have hope for us? <laughs> hope? Hope, yes. Um, <laughs> what, word would, what word would I have chosen that you just said? Absolutely not. Well, well, I just think, I just think, yes, there's hope that like anything can happen. And I mean, confidence do I okay. have a lot of confidence in that? Probably not. Um, That's an honest answer. Not, <laughs> <laughs> not, not in like a bad way. Just like I don't know. Well, hold I, on, hang on, hang on. I want, I want, I want, I want that. I need, I need to comment on. <laughs> it's okay if you're not confident in us. There's no bad or good to that. Like not being confident in someone, which is our, our generation. It's well deserved, and the and the yeah. hope we're talking about here is not that we'll age gracefully or anything like that. I'm just talking about in the context of what we're talking about. Right. You have hope. Uh, you have confidence in our generation that we will actually do the work to continue to support our children doing their work, so they will support their children doing their work. And if 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 I so hope is like uh, hope is is aspirational. I get it. Confidence is actually a little more grounded and it actually is a more interesting conversation than the word hope, unless you're hopeless, which is also an interesting oh, conversation. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know. What do you think? I, yeah. Did I speak for you there, Maddie? I don't mean to speak oh, no, no, for no, you. No, 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 no. Okay. No, I, yes. I feel like I said what I. Okay. Okay. What I thought. Cool. Yeah. Kate. I think that just like in our generation, subsequent generations, and older generations, there will be portions of people that do the work and there'll be portions of people that don't do the work. And you guys are in a more difficult spot than I think our generations are. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I do know, like I see you and I've seen other adults who are like, who are doing the work, recognizing there's work that needs to be done, first of all, and then actually doing it is a whole other thing. 
Um, and the fact that you guys exist, that does give me hope, like a lot of hope. Um, because I know there will be people that I will, you know, get older with that are just not going to do anything about their lives. And mm -hmm. there will always be those people that exist. But uh, I think you guys were kind of given a shit bag as well, because like we were from a young age, give or take, told, you know, therapy is OK and like kind of more aware through like media, whatever you want to call it, like friends, like a lot of it's social media. Yeah. Like that this stuff is normal and it's not fun and it's but it's OK and like you can work on it and other people go through it. You guys were not. It was all more so hush, 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 hush. Yeah. So if you guys can do it. Yeah, that's that is that is a good point. Yeah, I I think you guys are doing just fine. I feel yeah, if, I feel like it's quite impressive. Yes. If it was so like I just mental health, I guess in terms of mental health that like so swept under the rug for like I'm sorry, like, like that like, sucks. Long, yeah, like that sucks, but I think it's so. it is still more impressive that you're able to come out the other side, I think from that. Anyone, like anyone in your generation or above, like I think it's impressive. I, I do have a little bit of a provocative point of view about that because you are correct to a degree. Um, have I ever, either of you ever seen the movie Ordinary People? No. Uh, wait, I do know. Sorry, go ahead. I know That's this okay. movie is based it, in our town. Oh, oh I'm my pretty gosh. sure. I really? Yes, I think my psychiatrist actually told me about this movie. I'm pretty sure. It is incredible. But continue. It was written by... It was written by Judith Guest, who I think is from Chicago. Um, you won't recognize some of these names, but it had like Timothy Hutton and Mary Tyler Moore and Donald Sutherland and Judd Hirsch. Um, and the entire movie is about the dynamic of things falling apart on the inside, but trying to look good on the outside. And the young man in the movie, which is Timothy Hutton, goes, oh, I get emotional when I talk about it because it's such an important movie to me. Um, goes to get help. And, and I saw it in a family values course at my Catholic high school. And it was the first time I'd ever seen somebody talk to, because Judd Hirsch was a therapist, um, talk to somebody in therapy about what was really going on. And it was, and by the way, it like, was like won the Academy Award. And so my point about it is, it is true that a lot of people stigmatize therapy, but not everybody. There were people that were doing it, but uh, generally speaking, you're correct. So I am not terribly hopeful about my generation, nor am I terribly confident. I, I, I love a lot of my friends and all that kind of stuff, but it's just like their ability to unstuck, unstick themselves is um, dubious is the best way to say it at times. Some of my friends are really in the work and that's a requirement. By the way, that is a must have in a relationship with me. You have to be doing work on yourself. Like I will not be with someone unless they're doing work on themselves. Um, because at 50 plus we got issues, man, we got issues we got to work out. So anyway, um, let me just ask one more quick question and then we're going to turn the table and, and get, and I'm so pleased this, this has been incredible. Are there any particular, is there any particular kind of music or musicians that speak to you as you know, your generation? Oh, <laughs> You know, I don't really have any now. That's a really hard question. Okay. And you could ask me that one day and I'll give you one answer and the next day it's going to be different. That's, that's okay. Speak, speak. Well, to my but, but wait, hold on. So maybe that's the answer. The answer <laughs> isn't it's um, Beyonce or I mean, guys, Beyonce is kind of old, but um, whatever, Taylor Swift or whoever it is, it's because of the way you consume music, which is so different than the way we consume music, which is you have everything available to you all the time. It might be that if you like this, you like this and you find another musician and you like that. And one day you're listening to stuff that's very uh, uh, current. And the next day you're listening like the Rolling Stones and that's speaking to you. And the next day you're listening to you, whatever. So that's, that's a fine answer. Um, uh, all right. Well, um, this has been awesome. This has been incredible. I knew it would be. And I'm delighted both of you opted in on it, um, particularly after hearing the podcast with, with your dad. Uh, that means that, uh, uh, you know, I kind of fueled this a little bit, which, is, which has been really special. It's super special. This is going to be the last podcast of season three. I, I do a wrap-up podcast with one, one of my best friends, but this is the last one because I'm going to publish your dad. 
and then publish uh, you guys shortly thereafter. So it has been an indeed pleasure. So what the way we always the way I always end the podcast is um, each of you will have um, up to five minutes to talk about whatever you want. Or if you want to have a conversation about something for five or 10 minutes, you can do that too. But it can be about whatever you want, like literally anything we've talked about and you want to talk about it more, something we haven't talked about, because I sent you a list of questions and I told you before we started that I just tend to go on what feels interesting to me. And aside from the entire Arch 5 conversation, which was really random, uh, everything (laughs) everything else has been... uh, sort of on the intuitive feel. But this is a point where you each have the opportunity to talk about whatever you want. I won't interrupt you unless you want me to say something. But uh, whoever wants to go first can go first. I don't know if I have much more to say necessarily. Yeah. And I say that, and I think my dad said that, and then he proceeded to talk anyways. Like <laughs> what it's going to be. Um, I just, I was uh, telling a buddy that I was going to do this. And I just, I just want to say like, I Really, and like this goes on with like the whole like hope for your generation and like subsequent generations. I really admire what you do, what you've done, what you've been through. And I know I don't even know the half of it, but I do know it's been difficult to whatever extent. And I just think it's amazing that you've decided the fact that you were raised in with the idea that like it has to outwardly present is fine and then hide all this shitty stuff and then you just flip that completely around right and then now it's everyone can hear about this stuff podcast social media like i just you are really doing something beautiful to help perpetuate something that's not always fun or easy to do and i think it also gives hope to hopefully people of your generation older generations and stuff like that that you know what? You can be 50. You can be 60, 70, 80. And like, even if you've never gotten help or something physical, psychological, whatever it is, then like that's, um, you can still do that. And that actually brings me up, brings me to like one more quick, like rant, if that's okay. Um, your audience, I don't know exactly your audience, but like, I just have to plug for one thing, which is like, go for it. If anyone in, in your life, um, family and friends' lives is struggling with mental health stuff. And I know we didn't really fully get into this stuff. Yep. When you're an outsider looking in on someone who's struggling with mental illness, because it's behavioral, like it manifests in behavioral ways. You lie to the people you care about. You see the person doesn't hang out with you. They're not showering. They're not doing whatever. They get upset with you, pissed off, and like blow it out of proportion and stuff like that. You know, they they should have responded like a three, but they respond like a seven. Um reminding people like whoever's listening to this like that if someone in your life was diagnosed with alzheimer's cancer diabetes um gout whatever you want to like say it is like you take that physical ailment so seriously and it really hurts me and pisses me off that mental illness depression anxiety addiction any and all of them are rooted in your biology and that's in the cells and how they interact with each other and on so many playing fields. And the fact that people treat something that presents as a physical ailment as like such a serious problem, but they do not treat mental illness like that. And I know it's difficult because it's, I mean, it's much more complicated than physical illness. But I would just encourage other people who are listening to this, if they're struggling with someone who's struggling with mental illness, try to remember it that it is a biological phenomena. And um, to reframe, it's not just their brain, their mind being annoying and stuff like that. It is rooted in biology and they are trying and they cannot always fix it. And um, it's not as easy as people who don't have mental illness think. Well, you are a, a chip off Jeff's block because you said you had nothing to say and you just yeah. it <laughs> straight up. Beautiful. Jeff, so. if you're listening, you've, you've, you've taught 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 uh kate well anyway uh maddie would you like to tough act to follow Sorry. no 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 you are not following any act you are the act right now period um yeah i don't i i don't really have anything 
Well, I'm not going to say that. I don't have anything to say. I was just going to say, <laughs> oh my Lord, you both are saying this. Um, I didn't. That's, click. that's what, when, for, for now on, whenever I talk to the two of you, if you lead off with that, I'm going to start staring at the wall because I got to pay <laughs> attention to what you're saying. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have anything in mind, I guess. Okay. Or to say anything, but I don't know. I, I'm, I guess through the, like this whole podcast and even listening to the, the previous episode with my dad, I think. It was very insightful to mm-hmm. see how he views both of our relationships and how he views being a dad um, to two very different daughters, but also five very different kids. Yep. Um, and yeah, so I, I've just really enjoyed the process of listening to that, but also just the, the thoughts, the discussions that I had after. Yeah. Um, and I'm thankful for my lovely sister and my lovely dad and my siblings and mom. And yeah, I'm just, I, this whole process has just really sparked a lot of gratitude, I think, because there was a lot of, you know, like we talked about shitty stuff in the world Mm -hmm. and not just mental health, but just everything. And so I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm thankful to have such a strong support system and you know, I'm I'm coming home. I just got home from college for winter break, and uh, four of the five kids are here. Brendan's coming home on Tuesday or something like that. But I'm, I was telling my roommate, I was like, I'm so excited to go home because I'm just excited to like mm. spend time, spend time with them, and like, yeah, they can you know annoy the hell out of me sometimes. But I'm I'm whenever I whenever I say that I'm excited to go home, I always like take a step back and am just thankful that I can say that and i truly mean it um because like you said like some some people just don't have that close relationship and so yeah that's all i have to say that's no that's very very (laughs) sweet that is really really sweet and uh what i do want both of you to know is that this is going to be a digital asset that you will have for the rest of your lives both what your dad said and what the two of you said and i promise you that in a few even if just in a few years if you listen to this or your dad's pod you will feel differently and reflect uh, poignantly about all the stuff that's been talked about, Mm -hmm. which is the point of the podcast. Makes me very happy. Thank you both so much for being on. This has been a lot of fun, a lot, a lot of fun. And, um, and uh, have a, a a day that is brighter than the dreary um, weather that is out there in Chicago. Oh yeah.